I've taken notes for this one, so God only knows how much they're gonna help me. It was, I don't know, three months ago that I watched Dead Poet Society for the first time and still it will not leave my brain. I'm obsessed with it just a little bit. Naturally, I went into the Dead Poet Society Tumblr tag, also the Ander Perry Tumblr tag, but you know, that's a different story. And I found a lot of good stuff, but one idea that keeps coming up is the idea of a Dead Poet Society remake. Now the reason people want to remake is full, like, really big spoilers for like everything that happens in the movie. The reason people want there to be a remake is because they hate the ending. I hate the ending. I wish the ending hadn't happened like that, and yet it did. So people want to remake it and make it so Neil doesn't fucking die. <laughs> Among other things, but you know, that's usually people's biggest grievance with that movie. It's it's certainly mine. I did cry for three days. And then people figure that, well, if we're gonna remake the movie, why not remake it to be all female? Because the original movie was just a bunch of white guys, and why not make it again, but with an all-female cast? This is a trend that's been, you know, thankfully catching on. I just love all these hand gestures. Now here's the thing about Dead Poet Society being remade, not just remade in general, but also remade as an all-female movie. The thing about all-female remakes is the movies that they remake are not inherently gendered, if that makes sense. You know, Ghostbusters. It's about people who bust ghosts. <laughs> and Ocean's Eleven, the original movie, is about a heist. You can make any type of story told from any type of perspective with these premises. Hell, they don't even have to be restricted to a certain genre. They can be dramas, comedies, whichever. And so within that, you can have different kinds of people telling the story and different things that they have to learn, different things that they want. Like, you can have all kinds of reasons for wanting to rob a bank. Initially, in the first movie, George Clooney wants to, sure, rob a bank, but he also kind of wants revenge on the guy who owns it. He wants to convince his ex-wife to leave this guy, or ex-wife, estranged wife. I saw that movie once and it was months ago. <laughs> but those are his motives for why he does what he does, and other people, who knows? They could have an ill family member who needs to pay to live, because that's how medical stuff works in America. You could have somebody who's trying to pay a dowry for their fiancé. I don't know why that was the first thing that came to mind, but that that's that's a thing. You could have somebody who doesn't even care about the money. They just like the thrill of, of, of robbing a high security bank or casino or whatever. And I don't think this would quite work with Dead Poet Society because that movie is so gendered and there's a point to all of it. It's a movie about a white man teaching other white boys in the 50s to embrace their sensitive, romantic, artful sides and to not conform with the expectations of society. The reason why there are a bunch of white boys in this movie is because they don't act like white boys were expected to in 1959 when the film is set, or even 1989 when the film was made. They're all sensitive and hopeful and supportive. And if there were to be an all-female remake of this, we'd probably have to take it in the other direction, where instead of, you know, softening the characters, we would have to empower them in some way. Which, you know, the, the original does empower men in a different way. But in this case, we'd probably have to make the women, you know, stronger or something. So the, the message doesn't exactly translate in the same way. Also, Dead Poet Society is a play, and you could cast the entire production with women. Women of color, hell, even better. Um, it's been done before with women. Also, the thing with making it women of color, as much as I obviously support that, the thing is, uh, a school like Welton is so stuck within its time. There, there's a point to why it is the way it is at the time that it is. And I don't think people of color were let into schools like that at the time. Also, if this school were to be made with women, it would probably be at like a charm school. I doubt women of color were allowed in there either, and there would probably be this big emphasis on, you know, pleasing your man and learning how to set a table and embroidery and stuff, and then the empowerment is, you know, helping these female characters learn things outside of the home such as literature and such as the sciences and other humanities and, and blah blah blah. Also, if there is a female remake, I envision the Keating character to be a black woman who is a total badass. I don't envision her to be quite as, you know, sensitive as Mr. Keating. I, I, I picture her to be, like, more removed and, like, firm but fair. Tough love. 
Anyway, as far as a remake of the movie goes, I don't know if, if there's an audience for that besides myself and if we uh. should make one. This is more my grievances with the movie and if I could go back in time and give Tom Shulman like a good kick upside the head and tell him to make the movie the way I want to make it and possibly sacrifice him winning um, the Oscar for best screenplay in 1989, then this is what I would do. First of all, plot. This movie is very character driven, so there's not much of a plot per se. It's like, oh, visionary iconoclastic teacher rolls into town and stirs up trouble with the students. So we have a weird mix of scenes with Keating on his soapbox tied in with scenes of the boys just hanging out outside of class and not much is happening and you don't know why these scenes are put in this particular order. Also there's the issue with the fact that the Dead Poet Society itself, like when they go to the Indian cave and read poetry, isn't super integral to the story. It's the name of the movie, you'd think it'd be more, you know, central to the narrative. Like you could take out those scenes and it, it would pretty much be the same, we just wouldn't know that Charlie plays the saxophone. Um, and, and we wouldn't get the amazing uh, Congo rap from Meeks. The movie would probably suffer because of that. I, I think that's the reason Tom Shulman got the Oscar <laughs> for a poem that he didn't write, you know. And we wouldn't know immediately that Charlie wrote an article, but we, we find out about it later anyway, so I'm not sure how necessary it is to go over it in the cave. You know, it is kind of just a bunch of guys sitting around reading poetry, and they only read poetry in the first meeting, really. And then, you know, we get that zinger from Charlie on his saxophone and, and and that's that's really about it. Also the theme of the movie, it's a little weird to me, that it's carpe diem. I don't think you need a movie to say carpe diem because carpe diem is already like a really popular phrase that people have framed like in their bedrooms. So, you know. Also the fact that the one character who embodies carpe diem the most ends up killing himself, but you know, we'll get to that later. <laughs> yeah, seize the day as a theme for a movie is a little odd to me, but I do like that they took it in certain directions with each character to show what carpe diem means to each one of them as individuals. And before I get into that, John Keating as a character confuses me. <laughs> Clearly he and his dialogue are what makes the film memorable and of course Robin Williams, may he rest in peace, gave a wonderful performance as Mr. Keating. I like everything that Keating has to say except for when Neil comes to him for advice about his father. I'm not sure if it was the most responsible thing in the world for Keating to tell Neil to stand up to his father and and act no matter what and, and all of this stuff. Like, th this was 1959 when child abuse was just discipline back then. They even show that in the movie. Assume the position. I just don't know what Keating was thinking. Surely he has enough experience with parents like this to know that they literally almost never have their children's best interests at heart. So maybe instead of saying, you know, go to your father, show him how passionate you are, maybe Keating could say instead, wait, you've got less than a year until you graduate high school and then you can go off and be your own person and do what you want. But for now, you have to wait. I mean, were Child Protective Services even a thing back in the day? I doubt Keating could have done anything if it turned out that Mr. Perry was wailing on his son. I think the best advice he could have given him was to just be patient and hone his skills. They said in the DVD commentary, because yes, I got the DVD, that Neil's, he's really like youthful and enthusiastic, but this makes him impatient and he can't wait for things. So he can't wait to start his acting career. He can't wait to start up the Dead Poet Society. He can't wait to make friends with everybody around him. And this kind of becomes his fatal flaw, essentially. And I think Carpe Diem could have been a good lesson for him in that sense. And not just seize the day, but seize your life. Make a plan for the future and live by your own means when you can. I think that would have been a lot more valuable of a lesson to learn than don't be dicks to your kids or else they'll kill themselves. And I think that's what they were trying to get across is that he has to learn this lesson except he doesn't and he dies because of it. But it, it never seemed like that was what Keating was telling him to do. But I do like the idea of him being in the play 
and, you know, getting the standing ovation and then his dad bringing him home to chew him out and there's, you know, there's that scene. Ugh, I, I've been there. I've been there. You, you're, you're around a parent and they just make you quiet. So when Neil is prompted to tell his father what he feels, he just says nothing. He, he can't find the words and that, that really <laughs> resonated with me. However, what would have turned the tables for that scene is if Neil said something along the lines of, this is how I picture it anyway, Neil says something along the lines of, why did you have me? And his father goes, what are you talking about? Why did I have you? And he's like, did you have me because you wanted a child or you wanted somebody who would provide for you in your old age? Did you want somebody who would grow up to be a success? The day I was born, did you see a baby or did you see a future doctor? Was there ever a time when you saw me just as a child? Because I can't remember a time when I just got to run a little too fast or laugh a little too loudly or talk a little too much. I, I, I was always held back in this box that you put me in. And hell, that's a better way to seize the day than fucking killing yourself. One more thing I wanted to say about John Keating is that I wanted to kind of emphasize the parental substitute thing that he has for all of the boys. Because it's clear that all of the boys have pretty shitty parents and could use a parental substitute, but this isn't really explored within the character dynamics, and I think that's a bit of a waste. Keating doesn't have any children, and he'd probably be a good father, so why not make that connection? Pretty much the way that filial substitute relationships work within stories is that there is a child character who's an orphan, or they have shitty parents, and they need somebody to parent them, because all children need somebody to parent them. And then there's an adult character who maybe had children, but they died, or could never have children, or something like that. And then you make these two bond. It, it works in all kinds of stories. There's there's Carl and Russell in Up, there's Akila and her mentor, eh, mentor, <laughs> mentor in Akila and the Bee. There's every main character in Detroit Become Human. Wow, I am just now realizing this. I was just gonna give the example with, like, Connor, but clearly all of them have this. Yeah, hell, in that story, androids can't have parents and they can't procreate. So they're a bit at a loss as far as the whole parental relationships thing. Connor serves as a child substitute to Hank, who lost his son years ago. Kara serves as a mother substitute to Alice, who has an abusive father, and Marcus serves as a child substitute to Carl, who has a son, but he's a bit of a deadbeat and he doesn't feel the connection there. Wow, amazing. So I would have liked a little more, you know, fatherly figure type nurturing in this movie, but that's just me. The DVD commentary also talked about how there are kind of four tracks within the movie, aka four characters who develop the most, and these are Neil, Todd, Charlie and Knox. We already talked to Neil, although we'll probably get back to him at some point. Todd has my favorite character development within the movie. Actually, his character arc is my favorite thing about the movie. All of my favorite scenes feature Todd gaining confidence in some way or another, and I love it. Also, those scenes, two out of those three scenes are really gay, so that, that probably also has something to do with it. My three favorite scenes are the improvised poem scene, the flying desk set, and the scene where Todd chases Neil around their dorm room and it's it's super gay, but it is about Todd learning to value himself as a human being and expect that level of respect from other people. My only problem with Neil's character arc is that he needs to not die at the end, but other than that, pretty good. Charlie has a cool character arc. Actually, there's kind of a twin character arcs or like parallels, I don't know what to call it, but Charlie and Neil's arcs are related, and then Todd and Knox's arcs are related. Charlie and Neil need to, you know, calm themselves down and not take Carpe Diem to such an over-the-top extent, and then Todd and Knox need to learn to lift themselves up. Except Knox doesn't, because I hate Knox and I wish he wasn't a character. <laughs> Knox's whole thing is, okay, so he's supposed to show us what Carpe Diem means in romantic terms. The thing is, <laughs> What carpe diem means to him in romantic terms is to not know what the word no means. And when you like a girl, you, you stalk her and you show up at her school and read her a poem embarrassing her in front of her friends and 
you don't listen to her when she tells you you have a boy when you she tells you you have a boyfriend no you know she has a boyfriend and everything and then you kiss her on the forehead when she's drunk and you're drunk and it's it's it's, it's a bad time so i wish Knox just wasn't a character in this if you want to see carpe diem through romance neil and todd can be in a relationship because they are so gay it's barely subtext but you can see carpe diem through a relationship like that, especially as Todd is gaining more confidence. Okay, if we could just take out Knox and maybe focus on Meeks or Pitts or even Cameron, I would be down for that. Cameron, I mean, I hate Cameron as much as the next guy, but I also kind of understand him the more I think about him and his motivations. I think he knows that he's the friend that nobody likes and that he's only part of the Dead Poet Society because he's Charlie's roommate and Charlie wants him to not think on the entire group. So he just, you know, brings him along for the ride. And, and I think Cameron's, you know, so obsessed with the rules because that's what's been ingrained in him, but also because everybody else has this friend group that they can fall back on and, and he doesn't feel like he has that probably. So when shit hits the fan towards the end of the movie, he figures I should just save myself and my future and my reputation. And these guys would never do the same thing for me, they wouldn't, you know, put their necks on the line for me, so why shouldn't I? Why should I? Why shouldn't I? You know what I mean. I also like Cameron slightly more because uh, I saw Dylan Kussman's like mini interview on the DVD commentary about Peter Weir and he seems like really cool and smart and, and funny, so I don't know. He's no match for my boy Robert Sean Leonard though. And about Charlie's character arc, I was really really glad in the movie when we finally got a bit of restraint on the whole carpe diem theme because especially watching you know all of Knox's endeavors in the theme I, I was like oh god are these boys just gonna learn that there are no boundaries in life and they could just do whatever the hell they want because that just isn't true so then Charlie pulls his stunt and gets the paddle and Keating comes up and berates him he's like that it was stupid you suck on the marrow but you don't choke on the bone and I was like thank god these boys are learning a little bit of restraint <laughs> granted Charlie doesn't fully learn his lesson by the end of the movie but that's like pretty within character when he you know punches Cameron in the face everybody also talks about how like because Charlie has the whole name change thing with Nawanda that they want Charlie to be non-binary I am totally here for that end of the movie Neil's dead, Charlie's expelled, Keating's fired. This seems a little excessive. Usually when you have a story about a system, you have to sacrifice something, usually a character's life, in order to show just how evil and poisonous that system is and therefore how necessary it is that we take it down. One flew of the cuckoo's nest, do the right thing, Star Wars. And the oppressive system here is represented through Nolan with his toxic masculinity and his emphasis on tradition and really strong academics that can be too much for a student to handle. Oh, also Spring Awakening is a good example of these stories because it's, it's, it's pretty similar. <laughs> Neil's death, Keating's firing, and Charlie's expulsion are a bit too much sacrifice for one movie. Neil's death isn't entirely related to that, it's more his relationship with his father. Also, slight tangent, Kurtwood Smith, who plays Mr. Perry in the movie, said that he went to see the film when it came out with a friend of his and his son, and he said that his friend and his son had the kind of relationship that Neil and Mr. Perry have, and that after seeing it, they were both crying and it actually bettered their relationship, so I guess the film served somebody in a positive way. <laughs> Anyway, Neil just shouldn't have died because it, it messes with his character, even though I know the point is somewhat that suicide can happen to anybody, even to somebody who you least expect it from. But, but, it just really doesn't fit in with his character or the overall theme or the whole taking down the system thing because it's more his relationship with his father than the result of the system. Like his system and his father kind of tie into each other, but his father is more of a character than say Nolan who is more of a symbol for, you know, the patriarchy. Charlie getting expelled is pretty much within his character, so I don't see too much fault with that. I think Keating's firing is a pretty good sacrifice for this story. He's what makes the film so iconic, and I think taking down that icon from the narrative and punishing him for whatever for whatever has happened is a good way to demonstrate how evil the system is. And he could probably 
get fired because he takes the heat for something stupid that one of the boys has done. Probably Charlie, although maybe Todd because Todd's more of a protagonist and he and Keating, I think, would bond a little bit more than Charlie and Keating would, but, you know. Charlie just has fewer brain cells, so who knows. <laughs> but yeah, the boys might do something stupid, Nolan might find out about the Dead Poet Society, and Keating could be like, I was the one who rallied these boys. It could be like total Dumbledore's army type thing. Like, I'm the one who rallied these boys and told them to go to the woods. It's my organization, it was my idea. I'll take the heat for it, and then he gets fired. You can still even have the, you know, oh, cap the, oh, Captain, my captain scene from the very end. You don't even have to take that out because it's all of them standing on their desks and being like, hey, we appreciate you and what you did for us. And Neil can be in it, and maybe so can Charlie, because they don't deserve to not be there. I cried for three days after this movie, okay? And I still cry about a lot. It's like how M.A.S.H. is my favorite TV show. It's a sitcom, and I legitimately think I got funnier after watching that show. And after watching Dead Poet Society, I think I just cry more. <laughs> I'm really unhinged, okay? Ultimately, if we made this movie even gayer than it is, having Charlie and Meeks together, hello? Or maybe Charlie and Cameron together more because they're so, like, opposite, and if we develop Cameron a little bit more, that could be a cool dynamic. I hear people ship it. But I think having the characters be queer in some way or another is just another point of tension that the patriarchy wants to eliminate. I took a queer Chicago class last year, and we did learn about, like, protests and pride rallies and, and great stuff like that, but also how sometimes you can't always afford that luxury of marching with your community because sometimes people pick, take pictures and these end up on the internet and your family sees them and you can't risk that. You you have to kind of feel out for yourself what your situation is. So for a lot of people just existing the way they are and surviving in this society that marginalizes and discriminates against these groups is in its own way a form of protest. And I think the same could be said for the dead poets. You know, it's it's not as invigorating or as fun or as rebellious or even as powerful, but it is a truth. And I think dead poets is kind of all about truth. Or that could just be complete bullshit because I don't know how to close this video. <laughs> Making a lot of dead poets videos, so expect more of this. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Love you. Bye.